Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much for staying. And I'm just so pleased to be here and to be with the United Methodist Church and to be working with the Interfaith Criminal Justice Coalition um, on this very, very critical issue. Um, as Kara mentioned, I've been working on um, the syringe exchange funding ban for years and years and years. Um, and when you hear such great statistics, like you've heard with uh, Congresswoman Norton and Ron Daniels telling how far we've come, it just sounds amazing and it sounds wonderful and it sounds like, you know, we're really there and we're really almost at the AIDS-free generation. But I have to tell you, as you heard from Rev Reverend Carter Rimbach, we're still not there. We're, we really aren't there. We have a lot more work that we have to do and we have a lot of barriers that we have to overcome and we have to continue to um, address communities where the epidemic is, is growing um, and, uh, and be nimble in our response. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the ban itself and a little bit more about how syringe exchange um, uh, programs work and and try to dispel some of the myths that we hear a lot I mean we like many other issues are up against the same problem Congress just doesn't listen to science and uh, on the merits we are winning this any research paper that you read any pundit or or spokesperson that you hear talk about this I mean we have all of the right um, components and, and research the problem is you know, trying to overcome stigma and, you know, sort of the moral ground around the issue of using people using drugs. Um, so the ban was pla put in place. There are several bans. There are three, actually. Kara alluded to them. Um, the bans were put in place in the 90s. They were put in place about the same time that we finally realized that using syringe exchange and making sure that clean or sterile syringes were in the hands of people who were injecting drugs um, was one of the ways to deal with the epidemic, then at that precise moment, the bans were, were put in place. And so we were really crippled with having the knowledge of what was going to work to combat the ban with the limitations of what the reality met around the funding um, availability for, um, for providing those sterile syringes to folks around the country um, and around the world, quite honestly. So the three bans, really quickly. One, a DC rider that prevented DC from using its own tax revenue dollars on um, syringe exchange funding. A federal, uh, a federal appropriations rider that prevents US domestic HIV prevention money from being used um, to fund syringe exchange programs across the US. And then another international rider that prohibits uh, PEPFAR funding from being used um, internationally to fund the actual commodity, the syringe. Um, you, you all may be familiar with the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. And so there's a sort of workaround with the Global Fund um, because the Global Fund is a multilateral funding source that a number of countries contribute to and in which those countries do not have prohibitions around syringe exchange funding. The Global Fund money can be used internationally to actually buy syringes. So I've been, for instance, in Nairobi, Kenya, and met with people who have been able to use Global Fund money to, to buy syringes um, to hand out, but the PEPFAR money um, is, continues to be prohibited because it's just our money um, being used internationally. So those are the three bans. The DC Rider, as you've heard, was successfully repealed in the late um, aughts and has been wildly successful and on par with the success of other places. There are syringe exchange programs that are operating in 166 cities in, 30, in more than 30 states the district and a bunch of our colonies, you know, the District of Columbia and um, Puerto Rico um, and some of the um, uh, tribal or, or Indian um, nations as well are, are implementing syringe exchange. Um, the reality, though, is that those programs are significantly limited because they're only able to use their state HIV prevention money. So um, opening up the federal dollars that are, I mean, are already being spent on HIV prevention um, to let state health officials have the flexibility to determine how to meet their state's needs um, would be critical for their fight. And so opening up that money is one of those critical components that, that really needs to happen. Um, shortly after the DC rider was lifted, we were able to get the federal and international bans lifted. Unfortunately, though, it was short-lived. It only lasted just under two years. And 
only a little bit of money was able to get out um, into the hands of programs around the country. Um, in the next Congress, uh, the Republican House reinstituted the ban. We're talk this is uh, about um, 2010. Uh, we're talking. And so here we are again faced with sort of the same issue, um, but a new epidemic now. In, in the last 30 years, um, especially in the early part of the epidemic, we really looked at um, sort of this, ur it really was sort of characterized as this urban uh, epidemic, right? You know, inner city drug users, inner city gay men, inner city folks who were really at the epicenters of these um, outbreaks. But now what we know um, is that um, hepatitis C rates are higher than they've ever been. It's on par to take over tuberculosis um, infection rates across the world. So um, while we have made great strides in addressing HIV in the last two decades, and it's true we have, um, we have to be cognizant of the continuing HIV epidemic, but also the new hepatitis C epidemic, and the shift of the locale. It's no longer an urban issue. I mean, this is really a suburban and a rural issue, particularly as the um, access to um, pain medications has been restricted and is also very expensive in the, on the street market. And so people have moved to eventually injecting heroin. You hear a lot of um, folks who were addicted to painkillers say that they eventually had to move to heroin because, street heroin because the cost of painkillers on the mark on the illicit market are so expensive, and it's true they ver they really are compared to the price of um, of street heroin, which continues to be cheap and available and purer than ever, despite you know more than forty years of a drug war um, that has failed by all accounts. Um, so, as we're tracking these new crises, you know how we deal with the epidemic in the suburban and the rural areas, but also how we reach a larger population of folks who haven't been restricted to just inner city experiences of the last 30 years. Um, we need to really make sure that everyone around the country in all of these settings have the tools in their toolbox to be successful in creating the, the AIDS-free generation that we all really want to live in. Um, there are so many myths, though, that um, prevent the successful spread hate to say that, of syringe exchange programs around the country, though, because, you know, a lot of people think that syringe exchange um, programs really all they do is help to support drug use and that they increase drug use, actually, because they're actually providing the tool. And the reality is you heard from Ron, you heard in the video, the syringe is just a tool of engagement. It's just it's like sending your kid to play soccer with shin guards on. Right. I mean, it's about wearing your seatbelt in the car. This is about how to make this one behavior more safe for the individual and for the public. And so all of the statistics that we've heard and all of the research that's been done in places where there are thriving syringe exchange programs show that drug use actually reduces or stays the same when those syringe exchange programs are in place. Um, Folks who have been the most underserved, the most marginalized, who have had um, little access to legitimate um, agencies to support them in their lives in failing cities, those are the people that syringe exchange programs have been working with. Those are the people, like Ron says, who meet people where they're at and who only engage on the current behavior and create opportunities for people to become invested in their own health. And it works on a continually growing, building trust relationship. And so it's not forced all at once. You have to get tested. You have to get clean. You have to be abstinent. You have to stay abstinent. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of hard work. That's a lot of hard work for people who are struggling every day. Because you heard, right, the substance abuse that, or, and the behavior, that's just a manifestation of what's going on under, underneath, inside it all. And so, um, you know, these syringe exchange programs, they're not increasing drug use. They are connecting people. They are the bridge, like you heard in the video, to substance abuse treatment, to medical care. I mean, you're talking people who haven't had health screens, you know, let alone, 
you know, dental screens or anything like that. It's a place where folks can ha get access to naloxone, which is the medication that over that reduce or uh, reverses opiate overdoses. Um, it's a place where you can get case management so that you can have some continuity and care because it's really hard to keep all of your doctor's appointments straight and all of your prescriptions straight and your medical your medication regimen straight and your um, appointments at various services having somebody there to really help hold your hand and connect you to those services has been cr the most critical um, success of the syringe exchange programs um, and then finally I think it's really important for people to understand that um, this is a program that law enforcement by and large supports around the country. And the reason they support it is because so many law enforcement officers encounter individuals who are using drugs and who have drug paraphernalia on them and have been stuck. They've gotten needle sticks from contaminated syringes. And so this is also a concern for them. So it's not just the needle sticks though, it's what Ron said, it's about not just syringe access, but it's also about syringe exchange, right? It's about bringing those dirty needles back so that we know that they're not on our playgrounds, that they're not in our alleys or on our sidewalks. And so, um, you know, that is also, it's not just a public health mechanism, it's a public safety mechanism to have the, to be able to be the repository to, to collect those back. Um, I, I, th I think I'll just end there because we're, we're at time, but I'm happy to take any questions. And again, so excited to have such a strong faith-based um, component to this work um, in the coming months and, and years because it could take us that long again. <laughs>